Hey everyone, welcome to this edition of the Cutting Room Floor Podcast. My name is Larry, I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Church, and we're going to do something a little different this week. This past Sunday, with the aftermath of Hurricane Milton and what we perceived as uh, your pastors that everyone was kind of collectively feeling, we stepped out of the sermon series that we were in, Everyday Mission, and brought a standalone message uh, that Pastor Wes was the first writer for uh, on the first several verses of the 23rd Psalm. And the whole idea was we just wanted to give everyone an opportunity to pause, to release their anxiety and to rest and be restored by their shepherd. So we recognize there's a lot of people still feeling that way. There's this like post-traumatic event letdown of adrenaline that uh, happens and people are still feeling that this week. So all we're going to do is replay that message from this past Sunday and hope that you take some time and opportunity to rest in the care of your shepherd who restores your soul. All right. Good morning, Grace Church. If you're a guest with us today, my name is Wes. I'm one of the pastors. Can we thank our worship team for leading us today? That was uh, that was good. I needed that. <laughs> What a joy it is to be together. A week ago, I preached uh, uh, in the morning, and then uh, I'd gone to bed early the night before. So when I got done with the last service, uh, a couple of people were waiting for me, and they said, just so you know, the storm turned. It's headed straight for us. And I was like, what? I thought I was going to Tampa. No, it's coming right for us. And I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I got to get ready. So I went and tried to get gas. I ended up at four stations. visited four stations. And finally, uh, the last one I went to uh, was a 45-minute wait, and I was able to get gas right before they ran out. Phew, that was close. But what a week we've had, right? What a, actually, what a two-week period that we've had. I think about it. Actually, it was uh, more like, uh, what a two-year period that we've had uh, (laughs) together. uh, We had a pandemic, so uh, what a a, a four-year period that we have Endured together. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. So I know election season is coming up uh, next. Yay. Uh, Yeah, we went from the weather forecast, you know, it's going to pass. And then we go to the political commercials, you know. By the end, I was just like, ha. So I did come up with this idea, and it's to put on the ballot for the state of Florida that we are going to skip the next five hurricane seasons. Can we get 100% support on that? Would everybody vote for that, please? Yep, I'm going to suggest that. I have no idea how to do it, but I'd like to outlaw hurricane season, at least for a little while. My goodness, my goodness. Now, I know uh, some of you got flooding again in your house. Some of you came through uh, unscathed. I know there's a variety of uh, emotions that are uh, present here as well. Somebody here, you might be just filled with gratitude. You're filled with relief, right? Somebody here, you might be angry, you might be just spent, anxious, numb. How are you doing today? <laughs> How's your emotions? See, I've noticed this about storms. Uh, we get so much information on how to plan for storms. Like there's downloadable worksheets that you can check off, like things to buy. There's how to prepare your home for the storm. There's uh, all these different guides on what to do to get ready, get ready. And then there's 24-7 news coverage, get ready. And uh, nobody really talks to us about how to recover after the storm. Have you noticed that? Here's what I've heard so far. No trash pickup. (laughs) Stack your shingles on the curb. Don't put them in a bag. And I'm like, that's it? That's all we got? Because I don't know about you, but uh, I'm not only concerned about people's homes today, I'm concerned about our hearts after all we've been through uh, in the last few weeks. So we're going to step out of our message series just for today on Everyday Mission. We'll come back to that uh, next week. And I just want to talk to us about after the storm. What can we do after the storm as the people of God and Aside from, uh, well, let me just get down to the brass tacks. Let me ask you a question. How's your soul today? How's your soul? Do you know how you're doing? You might uh, 
wonder, well, what is exactly a soul? If you're new to this uh, language, let me explain. Soul is a real you. It's what makes you you, the unique you that God made. It's where your emotions, your relationships, your mind, your thoughts, your heart, they all kind of merge together, and it forms kind of the core of who you are. It forms your core identity. Your soul is the spiritual and eternal part of you. We might say to somebody uh, who gave, gave us like a real honest moment, like, wow, you really bared your soul, didn't you? Uh, if you're the captain of an airplane or a captain of the ship, they might report how many souls are on board. We use that when we're uh, talking about the most important stuff, even life or death, right? So uh, that's what our soul is. An author by the name of, of Dallas Willard said this, that our soul is the unity and substance of your life. It's what makes you tick. So with all that in mind, let me ask you the same question again. Do you just ponder this with the Lord? You might want to ask God, to come and search and know you. Um, think about the state of your soul. Jesus said that of all the commandments in the Bible, the most important one begins this way. Look with me at the screen and let's read it together. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. So there's nothing more important than your soul. Let me ask you, how is your soul today? Why don't we take about 10 seconds and be quiet and you and the Lord kind of search your heart for a second and just see how, how we're doing. Time for a little check-in. All right, everybody relax and ask the Lord, how is it with my soul today? When I examine my own soul, I have to just be honest with you guys that I'm weary. <laughs> I'm weary. Or am I alone? Anybody else just, just tired of all the trauma and drama? You see, I had things going on in my life before the weather changed. Like I had some other storms I was dealing with with just West, just like my own little ecosystem, weather system. And there were some storms going on there, and then uh, we have these collective storms that we have to endure. And I know that uh, it's not always well with my soul, uh, because during this past week, uh, I noticed that my fuse was getting a little shorter. Let's just say I'm a grateful Christian in recovery from anger. And one of the warning lights in my life is when I start to get really snippy. Uh, and you want me to just tell you what happened? I know. Everybody loves it. They're like, tell us, Pastor. <laughs> we'll feel better about ourselves. Yes, you will. And I'm sorry if you came to church looking for the perfect pastor. Uh, this is not it, okay? Uh, this ain't the perfect church. You're not sitting with perfect people. Okay? Uh, so on uh, Tuesday, I decided, uh, my wife and I decided because we stayed during Hurricane Ian and watched it rain in our house, and it rained down drywall, and our roof fell off. So we decided to leave this time, and we drove to Fort Lauderdale. Simple enough, two-hour drive. Oh, no. Five and a half hours later, I think there were a million people learning how to drive for the first time on Tuesday night. I don't know why that was the day that everybody's like, you know what I should do is get my driver's license. And so they were, it was crazy. And at one point, we were near our destination, Fort Lauderdale, and the uh, a person in the far left lane, now there's like, 20 lanes of traffic, and they were in the far left lane, and they realized that their exit was like right there. And so they stopped and turned on their right blinker. All right, now this is, on, this is near Miami. You know how people drive in Miami. I mean, you think it's bad here, but in Miami, I mean, people, were, we're going 95 miles an hour, and this person decides to stop in the middle of the road with their blinker on so that they can get their exit. I slammed on the brakes, and I just about lost my ever-loving mind. I, I, I said things that I don't say in sermons. Uh, it was bad. And I'm not going to say them today. And I'm sorry, again, if I'm disappointing somebody. But it's, it's just where I'm at. And uh, if uh, I knew it was bad because my wife did this time. We've been married for over 30 years. And she goes, easy, honey. <laughs> now, behind those two words is a whole lot that we used to fight about and she used to say to me, you know, but now she just goes, easy, easy, honey. And my dog looked up at me and she goes, are you okay, buddy? Are you okay? 
And I'm like, no, I'm not okay. Because this storm has been traumatic. And here's the thing about trauma. God has given us an amazing uh, just body and system, being a human being. God created you wonderfully. You're wonderfully and fearfully made, but also wonderfully complex. Because when trauma comes, when storm comes, when dangers are imminent, uh, God gave us this gift called fight or flight. <laughs> and that's why a lot of us are here today, and we've survived so far. Because uh, God gave us this ability to have this rush of cortisol, this rush of adrenaline in our uh, minds that help give us the energy and the focus that we need to stay alive and help others that we love stay alive. And that's a great thing, but here's the problem. We're not designed to live that way for very long. And if you know my story, I lived like that for much of my life, actually. Not because of the storm, but because of other storms in my life. See, past trauma can stay with us. Our, our, our mind might forget, but our body remembers. And when the first threats of Helene came, I started having anxiety again because of, I wasn't really over Ian. I realized that this, this trauma stuff stays with you for a long time. And you might have trauma from your childhood and it started to resurface or your, your fuse might got uh, shorter and you didn't know what was going on. And for a lot of my life, I lived in this fight or flight mode and that's no way that God has designed us to live. And so I've got some good news today. Instead of running from our emotions, instead of burying our emotions or self-medicating our emotions, um, we can actually ask Jesus to heal us after the storm. Does that sound good? All right, so let's dive into just uh, two and a half verses of scripture today. We're going to keep it simple, and I want to share with you one of the uh, verses that brought me comfort uh, this past week, and it's from one of the best-known passages of the Bible. If you're new to church, new to scripture, you've probably heard this before. It's Psalm 23. It's a Psalm of David, and here's what it says. Let's read it out loud together. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. So today, we're going to think about how we can position our lives so that Jesus can heal us from the storms that we've just recently been through. Or maybe it's the storm that you've been carrying around for your whole life. And today, Jesus wants to bring healing into your life as he's given to me, and I'm going to tell, tell you more about it, but it is so good what Jesus, because Jesus calls himself, see, David wrote this 700 years before Jesus came. And when Jesus comes, he announces, hey, guess what? I'm the good shepherd. And everybody's like, oh, he's from the city of David. He's okay, okay. They put it all together. And today we need to put it all together that Jesus is our good shepherd. And he wants to guide us into a place of renewal today. Let's not run past this and think we can just jump right back into normal. No, no, no. Let's stop for a moment and let's ask Jesus to bring healing to our soul. So what would that look like? Well, there's three things that I think David is suggesting in this famous Psalm, Psalm 23. The first is this, that I need to stop and rest under my shepherd's protection. Would you say that with me? Stop and rest under my shepherd's protection. So remember in the psalm, David says of his shepherd that he makes me lie down. Now, don't let that worry you. God's not a great puppet master looking to smite you or uh, coming after you. But here's what it's saying, that we are made with a need for rest and renewal after we go through an intense time. Did you know that? We're not created to just keep going all the time. Now, listen, I've done that for decades and it, does, it doesn't work very well. I tried to just get over it, get moving on, and run from the pain. But no, he makes us lie down. When he made you, when God made you, he made you with this limitation, but it's actually a need for rest. And it's rest that we've got to have, otherwise we'll break down in other ways. Many years ago, I was pushing and pushing and pushing past traumas and difficulties in my life. And I thought one day I was having a heart attack and I drove myself to the emergency room and the doctor said to me, I've got uh, good news and bad news. I'm like, what's the good news? He said, well, you're having a panic attack, not a heart attack. And I was like, okay, is that the good news or the bad news? And uh, he went on to say, well, here's kind of the news that you need to hear. He said, you, you're a preacher, right? I said, yeah. And he goes, well, I want to give you a prescription. 
And the doc sat down on this little stool in front of me as I was on the gurney in the emergency room, and he said, you need to listen to your own preaching. He said, because the Bible says, he makes me lie down. He said, you need to rest, Wes, or the Lord will make you lie down. He will make you lie down. Because it's the very way we are created. He created us with a need to stop and to take a breath every now and then and to rest under the shepherd's protection. Now, you have to know this about uh, shepherds in uh, David's time. That when the sheep needed to rest, they don't like to rest, but uh, they're kind of like puppies. You know, they want to go all the time, but they need a lot of sleep. So what shepherds would do is they'd create like a makeshift pen with, with stones, and they would place the sheep in there. They would leave an opening. And what would happen is that the shepherd would lay down in that opening to keep them safe from their predators. Isn't that a cool image? Think about that. He makes me lie down. But he doesn't just make us lie down and say, well, I hope everything goes okay. He says, I got this. You can stop for a little while. And then when Jesus comes along and announces he's the good shepherd, he actually goes so far as to say this. I lay down my life for my sheep. I lay down my life for my sheep. So that means that we can lay down under the protection. We can rest under the protection because I know like you, we're, uh, I'm busy and I'm important, right? I, I, this is ridiculous for me. I'm going to share with you. This is an honesty day. I'm just, I'm raw. Okay. I'm vulnerable. So it's, here you go. <laughs> I had this debate with God for decades, and it goes like this. I can't take time off because, God, I'm the pastor of a church. And you should know that I've got important things to do. And I've actually preached on the passage where Jesus says, I will build my church. And I've looked several times. It doesn't say, Wes, you have to build my church. And yet I've had this tension with God. And finally one day I caught myself praying a ridiculous prayer. And it goes like this, well, God, I'm going to take tomorrow off. And I pray that you would look after the church for tomorrow. And I pray that you would take care of anything that goes wrong. I'm going to keep my cell phone, Lord, in case you need to call me or somebody else needs me. In case you can't handle it, Lord, I'm going to be here for you. And then I thought, what am I praying? This is ridiculous. In my line of work, like, this ain't, this ain't my gig. This is his. And... Whatever the Lord has entrusted to you, you can entrust it to him so that you can stop and take a break. That's the first thing we need to do to position our lives in a way that Jesus can renew our soul. Second thing is this, is I need to ask my shepherd to guide me into refreshment. Would you say that with me? Ask my shepherd to guide me into refreshment. So um, the next phrase of David's prayer it goes like this, the shepherd makes him lie down, where? In green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. Sheep need green grass in which to graze, and they need uh, still water for them to get a drink because sheep are really skittish. They're nervous all the time because they're basically defenseless creatures. And so when David uh, is envisioning the Lord as this shepherd, then uh, he's saying, you and I are like the sheep, and we need to let God lead us into refreshment that only he can bring. Now, you can get temporary relief. There's lots of options for temporary relief from trauma or stress or anxiety. Um, the problem is they don't last, and the problem is we start to need those, and we don't look to Jesus anymore to help us. And Here's the deal. Jesus limited himself by becoming a human being when he came to earth. We celebrated at Christmas. It's called the incarnation. But when Jesus came to planet earth, to be able to relate to you and me and what we've been through in life, he limits himself by having the same needs that we do. So there's a story in the fourth chapter of John's biography of Jesus's life. And it, the story is so amazing that when we've preached on it before, we kind of skip the opening verses that set up the context. It's the story of the woman at the well and Jesus visiting with the Samaritan woman. It's a multi-layered story. It's really awesome. However, today I want us to slow it down and look at what verses set up that magnificent story because I just noticed them this week. And they are ways that Jesus is a lot like us and what he needed to do when the intensity of his public ministry and message uh, was meeting opposition that he was for the first time being threatened. 
by the very people who would end up crucifying him. Now, I know we've been through a lot of stress, but Jesus was under quite a bit as well. And look what happens in the setup of this story. John, his friend, includes these details. Jake, he travels to Samaria, and Jacob's well was there. And Jesus was what? The next word is? Tired from the long walk. And he, look with me, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please, what, read it with me, give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to do what? To buy some food. Now, I know this is not, I'm not trying to be Captain Obvious here, okay, but um, Jesus has some of the same needs that we do for refreshment, for refreshment. What does it look like to be refreshed? Well, when you're tired, sit down. And this weariness in the Greek word, the weariness means depleted, absolutely exhausted after a long season of labor. It's not just because he's tired from a walk. He's tired from all of the intensity that he's been through. And being a human being with all those chemicals and all that fight or flight in his own mind, he's tired. But he's also thirsty. He needs a good drink of water and he needs some food. And friends, we need the same thing. We are a lot like sheep, and Jesus humbled himself so much that he became like sheep. <laughs> and he limited himself in the same way we do. So we can't predict when the next hurricane is going to come, but we can drink enough water today. We can take care of ourselves. So has anybody ever driven in Wyoming? Raise your hand if you've ever driven in Wyoming. Isn't it awesome? I mean, oh my goodness, after being on Alligator Alley, I was remembering driving in Wyoming because uh, I, I like to go a little fast sometimes when I drive. And in Wyoming, some of you are like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with this preacher? I know. Uh, he speeds, he's mad. Yeah, I know. Help me. Pray, pray for me. Uh, so in Wyoming, here's what the road sign says. I, when I, I rented a car when I was in Wyoming. And I, uh, it says this. It uh, doesn't have numbers on it. It says, proceed at a safe speed. <laughs> proceed at a safe speed? Okay. That's like what? 110? 90? Somewhere between there, right? I mean, it's legal. So uh, in Wyoming, though, you can go a long way between gas stations. And one sign that I saw, I loved, I thought this owner of this gas station was a genius because uh, he set up like a little restaurant there and a t-shirt shop and all this kind of stuff, but he had the gas pumps. And it, outside of his gas station in Wyoming, um, he's, there was not another station for 100 miles. And so he put this slogan out on his sign, this is the stop that keeps you going. <laughs> Better stop now <laughs> so that you can refuel and then you can keep going. And friends, that's what we're talking about today. To take care of just the basics. It's okay to look after yourself a little bit. It's okay to rest today. Under the protection of our shepherd, let him lead you into those places of renewal and refreshment. What does that look like for you? Well, we're all wired differently. It might mean uh, taking a nap. It might mean having some fun. It might be getting with some friends that bring you joy and don't deplete you. And uh, don't look at them if they're the other kind of people that drain you. Uh, just, just get with people that can help renew your life. Eat a healthy meal. Take a walk. All those little things actually are big things. Jesus needed them, and we do too. And so we need to uh, ask our shepherd to bring us to this place where we can find renewal. The third thing we can position our life to do is this, so that Jesus can renew our soul, is to look to my shepherd to restore my soul. Look to my shepherd. Would you say that with me? Look to my shepherd to restore my soul. The last phrase David mentions is this, the Lord is my shepherd and he restores my soul. And I say this because this is something that Jesus alone can do. Some of you have been looking for that. What is that thing? Is it self-help? Is it self-reliance? Is it uh, some uh, uh, substance of some kind? What is it that can renew and restore our soul? And friends, it's Jesus and Jesus alone. And 
for me, I always want to run away from trauma. I want to run away from stress. Uh, if that doesn't work, I want to minimize it, deny it, ignore it, bury it, medicate it, rage against it. Because in those uh, moments where I'm real, I feel vulnerable sometimes, don't you? And yet Jesus invites us to come to him and rest in him so that he can restore our soul. One of my mentors, who's now in heaven, uh, was a Christian author, and he spoke all over the world, and his name was Mike Iaconelli. And he wrote these words um, in one of his books. He said, until a few months ago, I had no idea I'd lost my soul. In the busyness and clatter of my life, as I traveled all over the world serving God, I thought my soul was just fine, but it wasn't. I spent every, hours every day doing God's work, but not one second doing soul work. I was consumed by the external and oblivious to the internal. In the darkness of my soul, I was stumbling around, bumping into the symptoms of my soullessness. I was busy, superficial, friendless, afraid, cynical. But I didn't even know where all these negative parts of my life were coming from. Here, here comes the important part. Then I began to learn there is a difference between believing in Jesus and being with Jesus. Talking to Jesus and letting Jesus talk to me. Acquainted with God out there, but a stranger to God in here. And slowly my soul was reawakened by a loving father calling me by name. And Mike said, I found my soul again. Soul is the real you. It's the real me. It's the place that God meets us in the deepest part of our being. And our good shepherd wants to heal us and restore us today. Again, Jesus is our model. I uh, love that Jesus had followers who didn't always follow his instructions. Uh, because that kind of reminds me of life, right? And I don't know if you've ever tried to control other people as a, also a former uh, or a codependent in recovery. Uh, that's what makes me angry, by the way. And some of you are like, wow, this guy's got a lot of problems. I do. I know. It's true. Uh, but I know this very well, that uh, some things we can't control and some things Jesus didn't even control. Uh, so once he tells, uh, in his popularity is growing, he tells everybody, uh, Hey, don't tell anybody that I'm healing and stuff, okay? Everybody just keep it, keep it on the down low. And look what happens in Luke's gospel, chapter 5, verses 15 and 16. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster. And vast crowds came to hear him preach and be healed of their diseases. Read the rest with me. But Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Wow. So... Jesus is like, please don't tell anybody. The disciples are like, okay, cool. We won't tell anybody. Guess what? Yeah. And while the demands were growing, what does Jesus do? Gets, he leaves, man. Gets out of town. He goes and hangs out with his father, his loving father, to find renewal for his soul. And can I invite you this week to find some time that you can just be with Jesus? I know some of you are like, I, I, I'm really too busy. I get it. You might have to seize some opportunities, maybe in the car line, maybe between job sites, maybe after class. Take a few minutes and just be in the presence of Jesus. So Jesus wants to heal your heart today. He wants to restore your life and I'm sharing this with you because, friends, I want you to experience the joy that I'm discovering in my own life. You see, this, dif this uh, experience was difficult, difficult, but it was different for me than Hurricane Ian. Because after Hurricane Ian, I had hit tilt when it came to stress. So I sought out a new counselor. And I said, I know how to live during times of crisis, but I don't know how to live when things are ordinary and normal. Can you help me? And my counselor is also a pastor. His name's Brian. And he said, yeah, we'll, we'll get to work on this and explain the chemistry thing to me and all that. And then uh, we started with the weirdest thing. He goes, I want you to identify seven behaviors that you can do every day on your ordinary days 
uh, where you can be with Jesus and you can do good things for yourself. You can care for yourself. Now, that's a great invitation. I've heard that before. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the truth is, for five decades, I've messed this up. I've struggled and failed, struggled and failed, struggled and failed. And this time I thought, you know, before I am eligible for a senior discount at Mel's Diner, I'm going to figure this thing out. And so I listed seven things. And when I took them back to Brian, I thought, I'm embarrassed because these are so boring. You know, here they are. If you've sat here this long, you, you can hear these. Um, so I get seven per day. Uh, and every, he made it into a little game. He's like, every time you do one of these, you get a point. So for the week, you could get 49 points. That's not happened yet. It's been over a year, but I'm, I'm doing better. And so here they are. Get ready. Uh, eat a healthy breakfast. Walk every day. Read my Bible. Write my prayers down in a journal. Drink lots of water. Take three 15-minute breaks a day to pray. Uh, go to bed on time and get up on time so I get the proper sleep. That's it. Nothing heroic. No superhero stuff. I know you can hold your applause. Um, I'm not walking on water or anything. No, no, no. I'm not. Thank you. I'm not fishing for it. But I, I took him to Brian. I'm like, is this okay? And he's like, that's it. This is what you've been missing. Is taking a break to care for yourself instead of going from crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. Can I tell you, this is bragging on the good shepherd. Um, I am more happy and joyful than I've ever been before in my life. Right this minute, right now. Right this minute, right now. I, and you got to understand, this is five decades of failure here. You, you've already been warned that you, you don't, that I'm not looking for a pedestal. Because <laughs> I'll just fall right off. I've lost 61 pounds. Uh, my, uh, my doctor who told me, if you don't start taking care of yourself, you're, you're going to die. He's happy. But the best thing is I'm happy. And my marriage is good. And my relationships, even the troubled ones, are good. They're in the hands of God, and those are better hands than my own. And all I want for you is to just have that same joy. I live by a mantra, never waste a crisis. And two years ago after the hurricane, I hit rock bottom. And if you're there today, hallelujah. <laughs> because the Lord is your shepherd and can be. And I finally said, okay, Jesus, you're in charge of my life. You lead me and guide me. And these are not super spiritual. They're super simple, like green pastures and fresh water. It's very simple stuff. But friends, Jesus can take the smallest things and multiply them to bless our lives. My life verse has been, and I'm just now discovering it, frankly, <laughs> Jesus said, I came to give you life to the fullest. And I think, I think, I'm starting to figure that out, what he's talking about. I'm actually starting to experience it for the first time in my life like never before. It's just an avalanche of joy that has become indescribable. And Jesus didn't come and die on a cross and be raised from the dead and rescue us from sin and save us from death and bring us out of captivity and let us free from addictions and afflictions and offer to heal our hurts and habits and hangups and all of those traumatic things that we've been through. He didn't do all that. So we can go around miserable. Some of us are followers of Jesus, but somebody forgot to tell our face. And that was me. I love God. And today, discover with me that the joy of the Lord can be your strength. But you got to get with Him. So the storm has passed. And today, I want to encourage you that after the storm, get with Jesus so he can restore your soul. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all God's people said, 
Amen. Man, what a great message that was and a timely one for all of us. We'll see you next time on The Cutting Room Floor where we'll be jumping back into our regular rhythm and we'll be discussing this this coming week's message, Everyday Mission 2. God bless. Have a great week. Oh, 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 oh,